Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video as you see fit, so feel free to hit those buttons. Feel free to comment below and I would appreciate it if you'd subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as is released. You're also free to share my videos as much as you like because the purpose of this channel is educational in regards to atheist and deconversion issues and any issues related to those issues. A hearty shout out to The Rabbit Nation. Join the nation by hitting that subscribe button, and if you want to be, support the channel in a more tangible way, hit the join button, and your citizenship options in the Rabbit Nation will be presented to you. But today I want to give a, a second kind of Christmas special, seeing we're coming into the holiday season. Uh, I'll get back to my other series on when God kills and the book of Acts and any other text that comes to my mind because, you know, some theist or you mention it. Um, and I find it problematic. But today I want to talk about the Christmas story, and I want to talk about the overall Christmas story and some of the problems with it. Now, you can find the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. You can kind of get into, uh, well, mostly Matthew 1, but Matthew 1 and 2 with the whole Joseph and Magi thing. And then you have Luke, who gives us a more complete account, probably from Mary's point of view, where we have the Annunciation to Mary, we have Elizabeth and Zacharias and the whole account of John the Baptist. We have Mary and Joseph because of a census heading to Bethlehem. We have Mary giving birth in Bethlehem, the shepherds coming. Eight days later, Mary and Joseph head to uh, the temple. Uh, then we also have the whole flight into Egypt because of what uh, Herod's doing because of the Magi. And then they leave Egypt and end up in Nazareth. Okay, so that's the overall general account. Now, if you want that account, just stop the video right here. Go and read both the first two chapters or so of Matthew and Luke, and you'll get, and you'll get pretty much the whole picture. Um, what are the problems of this? Well, the problem is some of the details, and in particular, there's a big historical problem. Uh, Herod the Great died in 4 BC. Now, there are some that want to push him into 1 BC, but... The evidence for that is, is pretty scanty. The actual evidence states that Herod died in 4 BCE. In Matthew's account, he's obviously still very vibrant enough to make some rulership decisions regarding the Magi and butchering of the children in Bethlehem and so on and so forth. Um, the other problem is the only known Quirinius, who was governor of Syria at the time Augustus Caesar would have done a census, was... Well, he was in Syria from 6 A.C.E. until 12 A.C.E., a little bit before Augustus died himself in 14 A.C.E. So what we have here is Matthew saying that the events of, of the Christmas story take place during Herod the Great's reign, which he dies in 4 B.C.E., and Luke is kind of saying, no, they took place when... Quirinius was governor of Syria during this census that Augustus was doing, you know, where all the world should be taxed. And this is 10 years later. And so both accounts created an immediate historical problem where they couldn't have coincided with each other given the historical markers. Um, Jesus, then you have a massive amount of difference in time when Jesus could have been born. He could have been born 6 to 4 BCE, or, if we take Luke's account seriously, he's born much later, uh, you know, like uh, 6 AD to maybe 8, which puts Jesus, you know, much later, you know, 39, 41, which would be great for apologists because then it would actually push his date of his life closer to the writings of the Gospels. But that doesn't do us any good because what it really does is create a quick understanding that neither Luke nor Matthew were like working with each other when they were writing their Gospels. They were both doing their own thing, collecting sources. They obviously both used Mark. Uh, and they also both used a source that's probably what we know as Q. But all the other sources are different. Um, there's also, you know, this creates the historical problem, I think is pretty obvious. Uh, the other problems with it, of course, is there's no evidence for this census by Augustus at all. Uh, this is purely for the Bible tells you so. Um, in fact, it's really doubtful that Augustus would have done this in the first place. It well, it wasn't his style. So, and there's no record. I mean, 
the Romans were pretty meticulous about their records of censuses and taxes and stuff like that. So we have a lot of information about that. And we just don't really have any good sources at all for this census that took place supposedly in Luke chapter 2. There's also a textual problem there, you know, that they create because of this historical one. We don't have, obviously, Matthew and Luke collaborating on this at all and making sure they get their stories straight. Uh, a single account, uh, both of them doing a single account collected from stories that are mostly oral traditions decades after the fact, and they're not checking each other to make sure their historical markers are the same. That much is obvious. Um, and they thus they create the historical inconsistencies. Uh, they, you know, but that doesn't really affect much of the story because I don't think the story is really being done for this reason anyway. Um, we also know that these aren't eyewitnesses. We don't know who the writers of Matthew and Luke are. I'm just using those terms for convenience. And, but those names were attached to the Gospels at least a century later, probably. And it was when the church got more power and more influence, and they were kind of making inroads, and the first generation had died off, and all of a sudden we have this need to write down all these oral traditions about Jesus before they're quote-unquote lost. And we have a massive problem because a lot of these stories contradict each other. Luke seems to be, the writer of Luke, seems to make the note that he's trying to get a clear as account as possible and put things in historical order. Matthew makes no such claim. And so these two things are really going to cause a problem. Okay, so what's my evaluation of the Christmas story? Why do I think it was actually written? Well, I think Matthew and Luke had very different reasons for writing their accounts. Uh, both of the writers knew enough about the historical times to write with some believability. They both have knowledge of Jewish customs. They both have knowledge of how things would have worked, so on and so forth. But what they didn't really know it seems to me, is when Jesus was born. And thus, they both create two historical markers that are very different, that create two very different times that Jesus would have been born. That creates a problem if you're trying to use both of them as historical documents. They both can't be right. One of them has to be wrong, and one of them has to be right. Or both of them could be wrong. Okay, They're both making assertions about when Jesus was born, but they don't give us much. And it's not enough really to say it's a historical account. Um, they both use similar source material, but they didn't uh, really collaborate with each other at all. And so they end up creating two different traditions that apologists and people who, like myself, did the life of Christ several times as a, as a Bible study had great problems trying to reconcile. Now, the timeline isn't that hard to reconcile because they're, they're doing single accounts, but the problem is why did they write such different accounts that don't even collaborate with each other and give us the two or three witnesses needed for the events that is even a biblical standard? Uh, I would say that the part of the problem is they're both writing for different apologetical reasons or political agendas. Matthew has a political agenda of trying to prove that Jesus was the Messiah in the face of the Herodians' claim that Herod the Great was the Messiah. And so the Magi account makes sense if you're trying to discredit the Herodians and showing that Herod actually fulfilled prophecy for another individual to be the Messiah. The fact of the matter is the whole Magi thing is kind of suspicious to me. Number one, we don't know who the Magi were. I mean, it would have been a great historical note to tell us who they were and where they came from, but it's just Magi from the East. And so that curates a lot of vagary. You know, when the priests give Herod the, the, the note that he, you know, the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, uh, he doesn't seem to know it, but if Herod was making the claim to Messianic ship, he certainly would have known that prophecy and probably maybe even staked his claim in the fact that maybe he was indeed born in Bethlehem. Whereas this Jesus character, isn't he Jesus the Nazarene? It all speaks of both Matthew and Luke trying to do this ad hoc post-rationalization of how do we get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. And so we create two different stories to get Jesus born in Bethlehem. And while they're not complete contradictory as far as a, his, as a timeline of how you could tell the story, the historical markers they give are completely off. 
They both can't be true. And so that doesn't really help us at all. I think Matthew is writing to discredit the Herodians and exalt his view that Jesus was the Messiah and the Christ. And that's why he plays so fast and loose all the way through his entire gospel with, you know, prophecies of messianic hope or whatever throughout the whole text. And I think it's very possible that he may have made up the story about the Magi to put Herod in a bad light and to fulfill a couple of prophecies that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that, you know, Rachel weeping for her children prophecy. This means that Matthew is probably concocting or fudging his stories a little bit in order to make them fit the prophetic utterance. Luke is a little bit different. I think he's just collecting the oral traditions, and he is making a legitimate attempt to kind of get them all to work. He's collecting these oral traditions. The problem is he doesn't have any collaboration of that with any other gospel writer. He stands alone in these accounts. This doesn't meet even the biblical criteria of two or three witnesses. It only has one. And we know that his sources had been, been from decades later where the stories of Jesus had been spreading and getting different and like a cosmic game of telephone getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that was probably part of his problem. I don't know. I see the writer of Luke and Acts trying to make an honest attempt of sorting all this out. The problem is that the oral traditions were probably giving him a lot of problems, okay, and so he had to come and put this all together. The apologetic problem is that Jesus didn't have the origin story that put him in Bethlehem. And so Luke takes great pains to try to write a story that puts Jesus in Bethlehem and give a lot of details. But some of the things that he gives details of, Quinarius being governor of Syria, a census, don't have any historical veracity to them and put Jesus' birth well later than if Herod was alive at the time. So I don't think Luke and Matthew actually kind of worked together. They had similar sources such as Luke, as Mark and Q, but they didn't also had independent sources and different oral traditions that they were working with, and that, of course, created some problems. Um, I think... You know, between the census and Quinarius, Luke messed up there, but all he's really trying to do is put Jesus in Bethlehem. It's an apologetic marker because, no, wait a minute, the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. You have, you know, this guy is called Jesus of Nazareth. How, how does Nazareth have anything to do with the Messiah? Hell, even in the story, Jesus' critics accuse him of that. Oh, you know, there's no prophet, prophet that comes out of Nazareth. Okay, you know, and... That's why they're writing these accounts. Trying to get Jesus into Bethlehem at some point has become key to them, them presenting Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, as the Christ. And so, did they make it up? Well, possibly. Don't know. Maybe they didn't need to. I think there were a lot of oral traditions going around. It's just when they tried to reconcile them to their actual account or history, they made many, many blunders. So I would say, yeah, historically, this is really hard to verify. And the use of oral traditions, the lack of any second collaborating wishes or any historical contemporary writing these stories is a big blow to them. I would also say that if we tried to put this stuff into a court today, it would be dismissed as hearsay evidence. Um, one, we don't know the authors of the Gospels. And two, we have no idea where the source of these oral traditions come from. They could be completely made up. They're all over the place. We don't have names. Uh, you know, one of the other, one of the uh, accounts in this kind of highlights this, the shepherds. We have this shepherd's account from Luke, but none of the shepherds are ever named. It's just kind of an event that is supposed to prove that this is Jesus. Once again, written to get a prophecy in. So when you read this story, you suddenly realize that there's more apologetics going on here than historical work. And that's the biggest problem, both the both Matthew Luke accounts of the Christmas story. Well, I hope this has been a little bit helpful to kind of spark your thought about the Christmas story. There are a lot of problems here. Um, uh, the biggest thing that I have learned from studying the Gospels is this, that uh, on any account for that matter, is that the vast majority of the Gospels is hearsay. Okay, we don't know where it came from. We don't know who these writers are. And as far as we know, they could be completely making it up. 
At the same time, they often use enough historical markers to make it a believable story. But that's no different than if I wrote a story, say, taking place in Nazi Germany, that I could study the history of Nazi Germany and make the story a completely fictitious historical fiction without, you know, without actually having the events of my story be real. And I think that's maybe some of what the gospel writers did, particularly when it comes to the Christmas story. I think Matthew and Luke are taking a great deal of liberty here with both prophetic texts, trying to force Jesus to be this Messiah that they wanted. They're trying to give Christ an origin story that puts him in Bethlehem at some point during the story, and both of them accomplish this. But in so doing, they didn't realize certain things about history, certain things about how their stories would be viewed later, and so on and so forth. It kind of gets rid of the inerrancy of that scripture thing now, doesn't it? Uh, but in the end, I think, you know, this is the end of it. Uh, it doesn't really have any veracity for me anymore. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you. Hopefully this helps you a little bit in understanding the real problems behind the Christmas story. Uh, I always enjoy doing these things because it allows me to pull out some of my old biblical knowledge from being a Christian and a pastor and a scholar from back in the day and use it for a different purpose. So thanks for stopping by and I appreciate every like, share, and subscribe. We're getting very close to the ad revenue as of today. Really, really close. So keep watching videos. I appreciate all your work and hopefully we'll be able to celebrate uh, a moment here shortly for the channel's history. And as always, remember to live your best life. You only get one go around and then it's over. So work towards, uh, put your money, your talent, your resources towards the, yourself, the people you love, and to make this a better world. And, you know, don't waste it on the trappings of religion and faith, because that's a dead end. I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.